because, like I said, man, my, my bandmates, when we were, we were in that room together, people have no fucking idea of the fucking worth that... Dude, when I say we've been over that record for five years, there were like three or four fucking years, Monday to Thursday, one to fucking five, we were in there. Mm -hmm. I don't know any other band that does that. On this album, the drummer Danny Carey and I, um, we talked about, because I mean, he integrated a rototom mm. into his drum kit. And, and um, so I started going back and listening to all his influences, um, Bill Bruford and, and, you know, Billy Cobham and a lot of the wow. Spectrums and, uh, and Alphonse Muzan and so many incredible, him. you know, records that we listened to, mm -hmm. uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Um, so a lot of that prog influence actually prompted the idea of maybe cutting in a second drum kit. Mm. So on that song, at, at the three quarters point, it goes to his drum kit when he was, I, I was like, let's bring in another kit and do the second half of the song with another drum kit, thinking it might be a smaller kit. But he actually brought in his kit when he was 15 years old, which was a 12 piece Ludwig stainless steel kit with mm. 10 toms, wow. all like, mounted in pairs on like a single stand back then, you know, wow. and they were all concert toms. So I, I'm, and I actually remember the jump deck and I working for hours, getting these basically paint cans to sound like cannons. <laughs> and when he came in, I was so stoked. I was like, Hey, check it out. And he heard the drum water. kit and he goes, what well, sounds too good, man. It doesn't sound like you do when I was 15. So can we get it to sound like <laughs> sound works? <laughs> yeah. We'll set it back to the prog area, you right. know, like where it sounded like single skinned toms and, and mics shoved in the holes. And so that's where it ended up. Because, like I said, man, my, my bandmates, when we were, we were in that room together, people have no fucking idea of the fucking worth that... Dude, when I say we've been over that record for five years, there were like three or four fucking years, Monday to Thursday, one to fucking five, we were in there. Mm -hmm. I don't know any other band that does that. I, I, I don't know any other band that that's what they do to compose their fucking music. That many hours in there what we did go no one no one can dare have a fucking opinion about what i fucking do with this that's the thing that's just i couldn't do anything without these i, ca I can't write a fucking tune to save my ass he he can mm -hmm. or maybe just or adam can mm -hmm. and, but it's like but when we meet i think uh, you know the sum becomes Better than the parts, mm -hmm. you know. Man, man, this is like a cliche shit. Man. No, but uh, I understand. But the thing is, saying. this man, we've we that's what we do. If we're not honest to that, then nothing will happen, you know. But but we are, man. And we, the shit we went through, I cannot tell you, man. This many years, the outcome that this because we did that, it's fucking badass, man. The great thing about this this record actually was the fact that I could take a break. I stopped when they went on tour, worked with Avenged and Bad Religion. You could take a, a, a decade break. Oh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the tour gives you breaks. <laughs> they, they give you real breaks. I was like, I'm going to mix a Slipknot song, so take a week off, whatever. And then I took a month to do Volbeat, and I took a week to do some live Soundgarden, and I took another month to do Slipknot, the record. So mm -hmm. having that a great shift of focus elsewhere mm -hmm. just brought me back more excited as opposed to staying on, you know, building a house for a year or whatever. I think it took nine months in, in the end to make mm. this record. I definitely use a lot of, I definitely, when I record, I, I give myself a lot of options. I have a dirty amp, I have a clean amp, I have a, a direct signal. Um, I have a direct, another direct, this time I had four, two direct signals, one that had all the effects so it hit the DI and went through all the effects. The other one missed all the effects. So you've always got a clean DI as well. Um, and then when you're mixing a certain part in a song, when you play with those balances between those four different, it sounds over the top, but sometimes, as you say, to hear the clarity all the way through the scale of a bass, sometimes you need to push a little more of the, and depending on what the guitar's playing or the drums are playing, you need to push a little more of one or the other. Um, so like the crunchy, distorted sides, a little more high end, maybe you need to push that a little bit, it'll cut through 
on a certain drum fill. That gives you options if you do that. And it's not that difficult. You can have a direct signal that's clean and you can have a, a signal going into your amp. And, you know, I, I actually have two amps, which is, you know, pushing the budget a little more. You got to like get, you know, have a splitter and, and put a dirty signal into the other one. But for recording purposes, that really is something that we play with that helps find the balance in each part of, of, of the composition. I, I think... Um... I think you do approach it differently because a, a band like Tool is very built on um, intricate rhythms and dynamics. So being able to capture that, and if you go to tape, getting it above the noise floor, there's a lot of riding the volume control on the guitar down to one or two, mm. a lot of soft drumming. Um, and I put it to anybody. Show me another fucking record that is going to fucking do what we just did, man. Though there are some pretty big jammy moments, like the 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 last song, man. Like it's man, we I'm so proud of Adam because we just sort of laid down this groove, man, and then Adam just kind of jammed out, man. I, I, dude, I'm really proud of him because he was like the guy that was everything had to be so composed, and then he just stepped out of his shell and just did like his stranglehold solo, or <laughs> <laughs> but it's in 21. Right. <laughs> so I'm really proud of him for doing that. But you know, there's a a song called Tempest where I do a four and a half minute solo in, <laughs> and it was really a crazy song to write because it's um, three rounds of seven. It's 21. Wow. It's a riff in 21, and you got to remember our drummer, who's the best drummer in the world. Oh my god, he's just an <laughs> alien. I mean, he's the only guy I know can just you know do like you know like three. Yeah, different polyrhythm beats at the same time. You know, foot, hand, other hand. You know, and you know, maybe you can do four, maybe you can do five with, <laughs> yeah. with his wing. You know, I don't know. <laughs> when, when we jam riffs, I always tell a story when Justin and I bring the riffs in when we jam, and Danny will just start playing the most opposite polyrhythm kind of thing to it to the point where. I'll forget how to play right. the riff I wrote. I have to go, Danny, please, play simpler. <laughs> this tool record, I didn't spend any time because I was in the middle of mixing Alice in Chains at the time, and then they, they called and said, we'd like to start. Mm. I didn't really have any time to sit in rehearsal, but the previous record, 10,000 Days, I sat in for a good month, and I would write down the song structures and have my doctor beat and take tempo maps of well, where does it feel good today? It feels mm -hmm. good here. Let me insist section. And if, if I didn't understand anything, which was quite a bit because I, I'm a 4-4 four, four guy. Mm -hmm. They're playing stuff in 7, 11, 19, <laughs> like, 21. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's stuff on this record where Danny's playing 4-4 four, four with his hands yeah. and 21 yeah. with his feet. Jesus. It's some of the most he, mind-blowing. He's playing, he's playing 7 against 8 a lot. In fact, seven ha comes up a lot in that record. It does, it? and then there's elements of eleven. So you got the seven. bar seven and the bar four, yeah. and you have that whole eleven feel going on. And and it was funny we were in tracking at Henson. The bass player is like playing a riff, and I recorded it because it was an original thing. And and I go, "What is that?" And he goes, "I think it's a 19." <laughs> and I'm like, "Why? Like, You're heck? too shy of 21. We got to keep in this seven theme." Yeah, it's cr it's crazy. Wow. You know, like the first track we wrote was, I guess it was Descending. And once we were done writing that, you know, I never wanted to hear it again. And then, uh, you know, all of a sudden, years later, we finished the whole thing. It's actually one of my favorite tracks now. Okay. Uh, you know, I really, really love it. I, yeah, I don't know. It keeps changing, honestly. I love, I love the last track, Tempest, is really epic. It's... 15 minutes long. It really combines um, me and Adam's vibe as far as like the riffs and stuff. And then it just goes off with Danny. The vocals are beautiful on it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really self-indulgent, but like epic, you know, like, I mean, the guitar solo is like seven minutes long. Oh, um, I can't wait. And it just, uh, it's full of crazy time signature changes, but it's still, it's really slamming rock songs. So. Some of this tool record was actually guitar on the left and bass on the right for part of the songs because mm -hmm. they're playing against each other. And then the bass moves to the middle of the guitar mic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I so the, the tracking part of Maynard, I, I actually went down to Arizona with Matt Mitchell, who's in Pussifer, 
Uh, and he had been doing some demos with Maynard ahead of time. I would mm-hmm. feed them rough mixes as we progressed, and then Matt would drive down there, and they would work on stuff. And then, then Matt and I went to Arizona, and um, Maynard loves the blue bottle, the big mic. Mm-hmm. And that was his main chain through a 1073 with an 1176. And I brought down um, some alternate chains that I set up. I had a Soyuz 17, just super That's clear, mic. beautiful mic. Uh, 67, which is a classic. Um, and then uh, SM7, which is the get right up on it, never yeah. blow it up. Classic and, rock mic. Uh, a couple of little handheld mics, a megaphone, things like that. And, and he would sing his parts and I would comp at night and come back in the next day and maybe tweak a few things. But having the the ability to change frequencies, basically, and not the same microphone. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I did, you know, we finished up, I did finish up my vocals last year during Harvest, like between press loads, I was on the mic Mm. downstairs in the studio and then back onto the forklift uh, making wine. So for me, this was last year. They used to be a lot more uh, involved uh, earlier on, mm. uh, but as our personalities grew stronger and more stubborn, <laughs> it's best to uh, allow the other three stubborn people to be in a room and fight it out, and then I kind of like pick up what's left and go, okay, I'm going to run with this, right? <laughs> um, well, then I took, after he tracked out the whole album, six days actually, mm-hmm. his vocal parts, and then I came back to my studio, and we had just came back to my studio at that point, so I was getting familiar with the tracks in my room. And then I'd spent a day a song for the most part, kind of maybe mm-hmm. recomping some stuff and laying them out and then trying to come up with effects um, that weren't, they would be used in the mix, but weren't set and forget, like a mm-hmm. reverb or a delay. So yeah. a lot of the, the weirder vocal stuff is guitar pedals. Um, H9 with my foot on an expression pedal, manipulating as the song was being sung and um, the uh, Earthquake or Afterneath. Yeah. Did the plasma pedal get in there? I don't, Not on the I vocals, but it, it got in there on some of the on the weird. I mean, the solos on the record are so many, mm-hmm. and some songs are long, and mm-hmm. some they might only be in there for, you know, four bars or something. Mm-hmm. But stuff like that to me, it sounds cool and it's also inspirational. And um, the other pedal they have is the one that looks like the piano sustain pedal. I ended up using that on bass to have the bass hang over into the next section mm-hmm. so it could actually be done live. You know, the years has been pieces um you know 12 years ago 10 years ago it was in it was in various pieces and what pieces are going to go where mm. are they going to end up in this uh, piece or are they going to end up in that full piece mm. uh, you know so it ends up being uh over time you know it ends up kind of falling into a general realm but it's you have to wait until they're they absolutely put a stamp of like this is finished because you can't decorate the house until the foundation is poured. Yeah, that's right. Well, like on the, on the Tool record, Bruce Jacoby was the main drum tech and John Nicholson filled in. And, but Bruce has been there since, um, first of all, we went to school together. Um, he works for Remo now, but he's toured with some of the greatest drummers. And his knowledge of what a drum head sounds like and watching the drummer hit and knowing you can go deeper or higher could sense a pitch, um, but um, Bruce, I don't know, Bruce might have brought a handful, but Danny had so many drums. And we, we essentially used two drum kits, and Danny's kit is pretty extravagant. It's, um, it's, it's interspersed with seven mandala pads that he triggers live as, a, the, as just a drum. What's that? It's made by this guy named Vince DeFranco, and um, it's one of the fastest triggering pads. He, he worked for Roland back in the day, and I think he helped design like the the beam. The big kit? Well, the actual beam on a keyboard and oh, stuff like that. So he's wow. a super genius guy. And and Danny samples, so they would go back to the studio and sample sounds like mm-hmm. boxophones and things like that and tom, uh, tablas. And he actually triggers them in battery live. Mm. So not only does he have a, I wish I had a picture of the drum kit, but he's, he's at, on this particular album, he had four toms, a uh, rack tom, a roto tom, and two floors. But the songs were so long when we cut them in sections. If a section we wasn't using a wave drum, I would pull the wave drum out and they would fabricate another tom in there so we can do bigger tom fills. But inside that drum kit are these seven pads that have zones and he can play the most musical parts live while he's doing it. So I pumped that stuff through a PA while we're tracking to give it 
cohesion to the kit. Mm. On the previous tool record, I'd, I'd have Maynard sing an octave down and go to 15. That way, when I played it back at 30, it would be an octave up, but the inflections would be different or mm-hmm. you would vary speed and, you know, you, stuff we used to do, crazy stuff. And um, you can't really do much of that in Pro Tools these days. So I, I'd still try to do it, though. I can go as far as I can go. Yeah. We toured for, what, five five or six years after 10,000 days. So then after doing that, we, we're not a band that writes while we're touring. So then we didn't want to see each other for a little while. So we took a couple Quite years a break, while. Yeah. <laughs> had, had kids, went through some lawsuits, whatever. And then we... Got rid of the kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're off the orphanage now. <laughs> but uh, then we started working. So, I mean, it's really... Well, we worked probably a good solid five years on it, though, like we did on all the other Tool records. And uh, can I just ask you a question? <laughs> How long is it supposed to take? I kind of <laughs> wish I, I kind of wish that I, I could say it did take thirteen years to make because I, I, there really oh, yeah. is nothing wrong with that. Yeah, because then it would sound so good. <laughs> like every time you listen to it, it would be like, "Wow, this took thirteen we, years." We to actually make. rushed it a bit. <laughs> <It's so good. laughs> Well, the thing was that the way we write, it's all jams and bits and pieces that get pieced together. And sometimes things are written with the intentions of being a song. And then all of a sudden, the main riff of this song, six months later, turns into the verse or the chorus of another song. And we, we don't have anybody in our band that's a composer. So it's like we're all in there doing it together and day by day. I, and I don't suggest this method for any other band no, out there. No, me neither. Otherwise, me you may neither. spend 12 years. Yeah, <laughs> don't do it. Don't even go there. <laughs> but that's the way That's the way we do it, and that's the way we've always done it. And it, it, it takes this long for a reason. But, but the end result is we all completely believe in every bar, not just every verse, every chorus, not even every eight bar. Every bar is scrutinized. And that's the result of what you will hear on this record. These songs also, the, the way that we also work with, with Maynard or whatever, we don't give it to Maynard until we do that. Like, this is me and Adam Justin we're talking about now. And then we send that to Maynard because Maynard, what it takes for him to do what he do, he, he has to commit to this concept and this whole thing. And it's like, there's nothing bums him out more than anything. Like, we if we send it. this thing and then we change it, it just it's like throwing the <laughs> ultimate wrench into his work because once we give it to him, he he commits and that it's that's it. He does not want to change it, and I, dude, and I don't blame him for that because of the commitment that he has to have to do his bet. So yeah. that's to use his words. That's 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 the way right. we figured it out to do because we man we went through the whole bet trying to do that on the previous records like. Send him something, and then all of a sudden we go, Oh, wait, well, we just had to change this course, dude. And he would, well, you'd just it's lose a, his fucking mind. It's in a different time signature. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, you know, changing time. And, and, it's and not that's like, like five minutes. So you're pretty, Maynard would be like, So you're pretty much saying I just did all this work for nothing. And, <laughs> how disheartening. I, I understand his point of view, but these things that you're asking about this being done first or whatever, like uh, the. the descending, I think it was it. Then it was. Right, I, 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 Danny's <laughs> right. I sent. I, I was really excited about a few of the tracks, you know, and I'd, I'd get carried away with myself and I'd send it to Maynard. I go, mate, I'm going to send you a version of what we did today. <laughs> and he'd write back like, wow, that's awesome. Is, that, is, it, is, it, is, it, is that it? Is it done? <laughs> and I was like... Yeah, he's ready to go. <laughs> I had to write back, actually, well, stand by, you know. I'm not sure if it's finished yet. And sure enough, you know, the next day the whole thing changed and I had to tell him, he's like, don't send that to me anymore. Like, just let me know when you're done with it. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of like that became the protocol, you know. We, like, finished our stuff. He's like, are you really sure this is exactly what you guys want to do? <laughs> we go, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's like a yeah. boy who cried wolf. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and look, mate, I can't even imagine how he comes up with what he does because what a nightmare you know what a nightmare to walk into and he just and he absolutely just like blew my mind every time on every song on this album he just did something you know amazing and unexpected and 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 transcendental you know and just elevated the whole you know what we were doing we thought was like already quite fantastic 
when we were tracking, you know, we always like to set up the room so it's visual. Dan's got like uh, some geometry thing behind him, and there's always a PA and candles, and um, it's very vibey. And um, I remember the drum tech, Bruce Jacoby, was in front of the console. And I saw this look of panic in his face, and I was like, what, what is going on? And uh, all of a sudden, he just bolts out of the control room through this back door, and he gets behind Danny's drum kit, where I guess Dan was playing with such power that one of the candles fell over on his floor tom and started burning the floor tom. So the, the head of the floor tom went on fire, and there's sprinklers in the ceiling. So we were trying to get the fire out before... You know, the sprinklers went off and then the whole recording would be ruined. So that that was one of the um, most insane moments, actually. Dan almost burned down the studio. After I laid down my tracks after a couple of weeks or whatever it was, then we moved to a place called United that I think used to be Ocean Way. Is that, is that the Ocean Way? I think it's next to it. I don't know. It's, like like a, a, it's anyway. Uh, yeah, it's cool. But Justin uh, and Adam did their, their tracks United. at a different studio. And um Maynard, I think, did most of his at, at his house. In his bedroom, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then there was a few overdubs and bits and pieces we did here at our studio in Hollywood. So it was kind of split between those four, four or five places, whatever. It was pretty much a walk in the park, you know. The tool record we did elsewhere, except for the back end and the mixing was all done at my place. Okay. But we, we tracked the drums at Henson. Mm hmm. Studio D, which was the first time most of their, all their albums have been done on a Neve, except for 10,000 Days, we cut on an API. Mm -hmm. And this one we cut through Neve modules on an SSL. Best of both worlds. We talked about that earlier. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, the fatness of the Neve and the yeah. punchiness of the SSL instantly. Um, and then we went to United and cut guitars and bass. And I did the vocals in his uh, bedroom, basically, in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And then some bass and some most of those solos and stuff at my studio and touch-ups and mixing. Mm. So even even on this record, you know, there are times where, because they don't track to a click, it's human beings, mm. and the delay pedal is always going to have its own thing. So mm. there's times on this, actually on this tool record, where we might have had three boss delays chained together, and this one would be used for two bars, and this would be a bar and a half, and this would be... Mm. And we would actually play the delays while he was playing. Mm -hmm. and because but we you could committed kinda, that. Oh, totally. I mean, that's, and that's then there's brave. times where I thought I could get a better delay sound later, so mm -hmm. I would print a delay on another, just a separate amp that mm -hmm. you could play too, because mm -hmm. you play differently. And then I would fabricate it later when I was mixing. I don't know, man. I'm just so excited we finished this record.